Hey, uh, thank you for having me. I love this school. I love this seminary. Um, if you're at this school, at this seminary, wherever you are in your studies, you're at a great, great place. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I love these professors. Um, I, I, with what I'm, a story I'm getting ready to tell you, I need to preface it with saying this. I love my wife, okay? I'm married. I have a 10-year-old boy, an 8-year-old daughter who's going on 14, and I love my wife. Now, let me tell you about an old high school crush uh, that I had when I was in high school. Her name was Heather. And I'm just telling you, she was gorgeous. And I mean, uh, when I became a Christian, started going to church, and her dad was the pastor of this church, and her brother uh, was one of my best friends, is still one of my best friends. And I just thought, wow, God, this is your plan, sovereignty. I can see it right here. I mean, you've led me to yourself to bring me to this uh, beautiful, you know, creation. I just thought, man, you know, so beautiful. And I thought about it, and I just was like, man, I got to ask her out, and I worked up the courage, and I asked her out, and she said no, and and I don't understand why she said no. I mean, back then, I I didn't look like a cross between Dr. Evil and Uncle Fester. I mean, back then, I had (laughs) bleached blonde hair and looked like Billy Idol, but I mean, I was a hunk of hunk of burning love, so... I didn't understand why she said no, and so I just thought, okay, it's obviously it's her, it's not me, right? So I just thought, I'm going to keep on asking her out, and I asked her out again, and she said, oh, Caleb, you know what? I don't want anything to ruin our friendship. Come on, you can't be friends after that. What kind of a line is that, right? And so I kept on praying about it, and prom time was coming up, and I just thought, okay, I really need to put my best foot forward, because if I put my best foot forward, you know, she's going to say yes. And so I decided to ask her out for the prom. But here's what I did. I made a video to ask her out. I found out what her favorite restaurants were. And I went and filmed a little video of myself there. Filmed a video of just on the street people saying, yeah, you should go out with Caleb or whatever. And I even took a couple dance lessons and, you know, I mean, showed her my dance moves. I mean, I had it bad. And I was a freak back then, so don't judge me. But I put this whole video together And I dropped it off at her locker, and I said, hey, just watch this, and uh, I'll call you later on. You let me know what you think. And she was like, okay. And I'm like, "Like, there's no way she could say no. I put so much effort into that. She's got to at least give me a pity date. If she gives me a pity date, we'll see. So I call her later on that afternoon. I'm like, do you watch the video? She's like, yeah. And I said, okay. Do you want to go to the prom with me? No. I'm like, God, why are you letting me down, dude? Capital D. I mean, come on, why, why is it that I can't go out with this, with this young woman? It just seems like it fit. And, and from that point on, Heather and I were friends, but we just kind of drifted apart, and that was okay because she was a year ahead of me and went off to college, and I was still in high school, and it, it just kind of worked out. And I, I thought back to that time, and I want to share it with you this morning because it symbolizes something that I have learned in my life over and over and over again, and it always seems to frustrate me. It always seems to annoy me. All of us in this room, we have people that will probably be with us forever, to some degree, however you want to define it, whether it's your spouse, it's your kids, it's your siblings. For some of you, it's unfortunately your siblings. You know, you share DNA with them, so yeah, you kind of have to be nice to them. I mean, we have friends that are kind of like best friends, but there are people who have come into my life, and I thought that they would be there forever. And then all of a sudden, They move on, or I move away, and the relationship just kind of fades. And I try to connect with him again, and we connect, but it's nothing like what it was before. And see, I'm an extrovert. I mean, my Myers-Briggs is ENTP. So I'm a strategic extrovert that's not organized. I mean, that's who I am. (laughs) And so I'm always thinking, man, you know, why is that? Why is that? Why is it that some people come into our lives, and then they're gone? I mean, you've experienced this as a student, right? I mean, you're here if you're an undergrad for four years, if you're in graduate school, whether you're a commuter, you live on campus or whatever, you have friendships that you have made, and maybe a couple of those will last into the rest of your life, but a lot of them will just kind of fade away. And then some of you teach here. You work, on, you work on staff here, and you have done ministry in life, and you have prepared events, and you have gone into the office of another faculty member and shut the door just kind of vented about something, and then that person moves on to a different school, a different post, maybe they retire, and the relationship just kind of 
fades away. And maybe you try to get back in contact, or maybe you thought you would hear from them, and you don't. Or maybe they thought that they would hear from you, and then they don't. What do we do in those circumstances when people just seem to move on? I mean, if you're preparing for pastoral ministry at any point, let me just let you know that the typical American Christian has made church hopping a sport, okay? It is a sport. Americans are so good at hopping from church to church to church. And that's why I'm always so suspicious of the family that I meet when they come up to me and they just want to be my best friend immediately and they're like, oh, you're so great and everything. I'm like, yeah, I'll give you two months. I mean, there's just something about that. As a pastor, you got to get used to that because people will come and go and as your church grows, I mean, there's loss along with growth. That's part of change. So what do we do in these circumstances when people come into our life and then they leave? We think people are going to be there forever and then they just kind of fade off. We move away but then we realize that our relationship moves away at the same time. With the brief amount of time that we have today, I just want us to digest this and talk about this. And so be able, to be able to do this, uh, if you have your mobile devices or Bible, we're gonna go back all the way to the very beginning of the Bible, back to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13, just to give you a refresher, I'm not sure where you are in your Old Testament survey studies or anything like that, but. We're joining Abraham, and I'm going to, I know the text says Abram, but I'm going to call him Abraham, so just get used to it, okay? We're going to join Abraham right after he's been called out of his hometown. And he's already had just quite a, an experience. I mean, he's gone to Egypt and lied about his wife and didn't want her to get in trouble or him, and so he lied about her to Pharaoh, saying that my wife is my sister because she's really beautiful, and God's like, no, you don't do that. And I mean, he's just had quite an experience already, and he has no idea the adventures that are getting ready to fall upon him in the future. But he has this guy, actually his nephew, named Lot, who's traveling around with him and following him wherever he goes. And so Abraham is very wealthy, has a lot of property, a lot of animals, a lot of money and and servants and, and soldiers and different people. But then Lot does too. Lot has his own people. And so they arrive in this place it's a very, very small place as we're going to see, and, and then something transpires in which I think we're going to learn a very, very important principle that all of us need to wrap our mind around, no matter if we're in ministry or not, no matter if we're preparing for this vocation, no matter if we're married, if we're going to be married, if we're going to be single or widowed for the rest of our life, whatever that looks like for you, I guarantee you, this is so applicable to where you are in your life, in your ministry, in your family. Take a look with me at Genesis chapter 13, beginning with verse 5. It says, Now Lot, who is moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herders and Lot's. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. And, and so they're fighting because there's not that much room. And you know, I mean, come on, you know that anytime you get people who even are family together in a, a, a short space, in a small space, there's going to be fighting. You're going to experience that next week at Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> You're going to have people that you spend time with, and the only reason why you do is because that you share their DNA. And they're going to come over to your house, you're going to go over to their house, but then the good thing is you get to leave that evening, right? And you get to go back home. They didn't. And so this cramped quarter system, it really made them quarrel and fight. And we get the idea from the original language that this is verbal fighting, not really fist fighting. But I think it's also interesting that the author of Genesis says that the Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. Now, that could be to just say, hey, it's even more crowded, this small space than what we thought. Or it could also be that if these two uh, tribal groups of people over here see that they're not getting along, it would be easier for them to come in and to divide them, maybe even to conquer and take their possessions. And so take a look. Abraham, or Abram is the one that actually initiates in verse 8. So Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives, right? I mean, it's always good to be the first person that speaks out. But I mean, how hard is that, right? As you start getting little voices in your head, you're like, man, if that other person really cared about me, they'd speak out. It's like, no, you actually need to be the one that speaks out. 
I love what Paul says in Romans 12, 18. He actually says, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. And so Paul kind of tells us that your peace with other people is not dependent on how they treat you, it's dependent on how you treat them. Because God said, I'm never gonna hold you accountable for their actions, I hold you accountable for your actions and your emotions and how you treat people. I mean, I think that's a good thing, but it's also a frustrating thing because that means that we have to control ourselves and sometimes we have to be the person that makes the first move of peace, which Abraham does right here. Abraham continues in verse, uh, in, in verse nine. He says, is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. And if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zoar was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 11 says, so Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. And the two men parted company. Now let's just stop right there. There are a couple of like foreshadowing, foreboding uh, words and phrases that we get right here. First of all, the word east. When you read the book of Genesis, any time it says somebody's going to the east, you should hear the underscoring suspense music. Nobody really had it good in the east. The east looked really good, but when people went there, bad things happened to them. And so Lot looks and he chooses a land that seems to be the best, the most fruitful. And then you also see foreshadowing because it says, hey, it's like the garden of the Lord. Well, what happened last time we checked in the garden of the Lord? Right? Humanity done messed it up. And Lot's going to do it again. I mean, you cannot, you cannot establish your tents that close to wickedness without accountability and not have it rub off on your soul. And so, but Abraham says, I'm going to let him make that choice because he is accountable to God for his life. I'm accountable to God for my life. And Abraham continues the conversation in verse 12, or I mean, we, we learn more about this in verse 12. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities of the plain, and he pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked, and they were sinning greatly against the Lord. And so we have this illustration here. We have this story from Scripture where you have two people that are as close as family. They're together, and they're not getting along, and they're fighting back and forth. And I don't know, we don't know if Abram and, and Lot were fighting. I mean, they could have been quarreling, but to some degree, eventually, if their people are fighting, they're going to start fighting because they're going to take up for their people, and, and that's what's going to happen. It's going to make it worse. And so Abram makes this move, but here's what I think is interesting. He doesn't try to work it out. He doesn't try to get Lot to stay. He doesn't try to say, hey, Lot, just, you know what? You have these feeding times from two to four. We're going to do from one to three. And, and that's how it's going to work. No, 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 no. What Abram does is he lets Lot make his own decision. And a while ago, I was reading this passage, and it really dawned on me, this principle. And it's something that I've seen woven throughout the story and the narrative of Scripture. It's this. That when people walk away from you, let them go. Hear me on this, and I know it's difficult because we have emotions attached to people, right? When people walk out of your life, let them go. When friends move on and, and you reach out to them and they're kind of reach out to you every now and then, let that be. Let them go. When, when individuals, when work individuals, and you take a different job or they take a different job, and you part ways and you were so close at work and now you don't have that bond anymore that you used to, that, that, that similarity, and you hardly hear from them, even when you reach out, let them go. Now understand, I'm not talking about marriage and I'm not talking about your kids. They're still accountable for their own issues and that's a whole different sermon. But I'm talking about your everyday relationships. And I'm talking about your friendships. 
not your spousal covenantal relationships, not your kids. I'm talking about your everyday relationships. Let them go. And again, this was repeated throughout Scripture, right? Because didn't Jesus have people who walked away from him? Remember in the book of John, when Jesus said, hey, you have no part of me unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood? And people back then, they really wouldn't have concept of communion yet or the Lord's Supper. I mean, they're thinking, that's awkward, right? I mean, it sounds like twilight. And it, it's, it, Jesus says awkward things in the Gospels, but it's not bad awkward because every single thing that Jesus does always has a greater point. There's always something beyond what he's saying there. And when people walked away from him in the Gospel of John, when he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have no part, what did he do? Did he go, hey, wait, come back, come back, guys, come on, come on, I need more Twitter followers, come, come on, come on, come on, i got to build my social media platform. No, that's not what he did. Did he say, hey, guys, listen, some really cool stuff is going to be happening, okay? There's going to be a light show up on the Mount of Transfiguration soon. Um, I'm going to be multiplying the fishes and loaves, so you're going to be able to eat there. Um, you know, I'm going to pull money out of a fish. I mean, who's done that before? He doesn't try to convince them to stay. He lets them go. The Apostle Paul had people walk away from him. And what did he do? He let them go. I've realized that one of the biggest mistakes that I can ever make in my life, whether it's my personal life, whether it's my vocational life, whether it's my, you know, anything like that, is to try to convince people to stay when it's time for them to go. The best thing you can do is to let people walk away from you when they do walk away, okay? A couple reasons why. Number one, I believe that there are some people in your life right now, as there have been in the past, that are seasonal friends. And there, there is a big difference between seasonal companions and lifelong friends and companions. There's a big difference between people that you share a bond with, a common bond because of where you go to school, where you work, and maybe other, or go to church, and other than that, you wouldn't have much in common. That when they move on, the relationship kind of moves on. And you still have those emotional attachments there. But, there. but something bad happens when you take seasonal people and you try to turn them into lifelong people. Lot was only in Abram's life as a companion for a season. And when that season was up, Abraham said, go ahead. You have first choice. You can go this way, and I'll go this way. You can go this way, and I'll go this way. I've, ha I've had this happen to me so many times, people. I've had families in my church that my wife and I have gone out to eat with, and we've had dinner with, and we've been in small groups and community groups or Bible studies or whatever you want to call it together, and, and we just think, man, we are going to do life together together. And then all of a sudden I hear rumors about them wanting to leave the church. And, and then I start thinking to myself, maybe if I try to start controlling things, that won't happen. And so I'll, I'll sit down with them and, you know, bring up the conversation in a nonchalant way. I'll be like, God, open up the door for me because these people are obviously wayward. They don't want to be at my church anymore, right? I mean, they need to be closer with you so they'll stay here. And, and so, I, you know, have that conversation with them. And I'd convince them to stay for a little bit longer. And when they leave, it is 10 times worse than if I would have let them go in that moment. There, when my wife and I became pregnant and we had our kids, we entered a different season of life. When we got married, we entered a different season of life. We had all these single friends, you know, when we got married. And then after we got married, we started hanging out with other married people. And we still hung out with some of our single friends but those relationships began to kind of fade away. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That doesn't even mean that you're not friends. That just mean, means that that season of closeness that you had, it's been time to move on. And I've had situations where I've had conversations with friends that are kind of moving on, or they've had conversations with me, and we try to convince ourselves to be as close as we were before, and what happens? We end up being inauthentic. We end up manufacturing a relationship it was never meant to be that in the first place. And when people wander off, you know, it is so incredibly easy for me to be able to think to myself, you know, well, obviously they've got issues. Obviously it's that, or I could shame myself saying, I'm just a problem. I'm 
just a bad person. I just, if I grew more hair, they would love me. If I dressed differently, if I wore skinny jeans, they, they would be like my friend again or what. I, you can't do that. Because sometimes people don't leave because they're mad at you. Sometimes people leave because they have their own issues in their life that they're going through and they're dealing through. And to a certain degree, it's time for us to start developing and growing our emotional intelligence and our self-awareness. And so when people leave, let them go. When people walk out of your life, let them go. Never try to turn seasonal friends into lifelong friends because bad things will happen. But then there's one other reason why you can actually let people go. I mean, there's one, and this is the biggest reason of all. And I want to start by going back to scripture, and I want to read a verse that we actually didn't read. I want to read the verse right before uh, Genesis 13.5. I started at Genesis 13.5, but I want to read Genesis, uh, actually, 13.3. It says, from Negev, Abraham went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, and where he had first built an altar. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. You see, right before this whole instance happened, what does Abram do? He's working on his relationship with God. You see, I think that one of the reasons why Abraham was able to make the good choice and the harder choice in this situation was because he, at this point in his life, had a very deep, intimate relationship with God. And I think that you and I have to be constantly cultivating and deepening our intimacy with God because our intimacy with God gives us the clarity to see beyond our current circumstances. And it's, it's cultivating and deepening our intimacy with God that helps us to realize that he's our friend, that he's enough for us, that he's our source of eternal joy, no matter who's in our life or who's not in our life. Because if we have God, It's our eternal constant companion who indwells us, surrounds us, goes before us, and lives with us. Then it doesn't matter who's in our life and who's not. Because we we, we, we feel God. We have this intimacy with God. And what I think is funny is that in Romans 4, Abram is called, I mean, basically, Paul calls him the father of faith, right, in so many ways. You go back to Abram's life and you read his story. I mean, the guy's a yo-yo, Right? He starts out really good in Genesis 12. Hey, leave everything and follow me. That's cool. Gets to Egypt, lies about his wife, is okay with her hooking up with Pharaoh. And then God says, no way. And then he goes back and he makes this good decision, but he's going to make other bad decisions, right? I mean, remember Sarah and Hagar, right? We're not going to go there, but you remember that story. That turned out really great, right? But you look at situation after situation, but he's still called the father of faith. And that gives me encouragement that he's a yo-yo because I'm a worse yo-yo than he is. Because my faith and his faith is not like this. With every great victory, there's a setback. With 10 steps forward, you take five steps back, but you're still five steps forward than you were before. And the only way that can happen is with his intimacy with God. And I think it's his intimacy that he developed with God in this moment that allowed him to say this to Lot. Lot, you want to go this way? That's fine. I'll go this way. If you want to go to the left, please go to the left. I'm going to go over here to the land to my right. And I, who knows, maybe Lot said something like, how could that be? I mean, come on, Abraham, this is really cool. Are you sure you don't want this? No, it's okay. You know, I, I didn't fight to get to this point in my life. And I'm not going to fight to keep something that already belongs to God because he's enough for me. And I think this was a huge test in his character because God said, hey, Abraham, is the relationship with me enough? Or are you going to fight to keep this? Are you going to let him go? Or are you going to fight to keep him here? And when Abraham made the right decision, dude, look at what happens. In verse 14, the Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are to the north and south, to the east and west. All of the land you see I will give you and your offspring forever. 
I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. See, every time in the book of Genesis when Abraham passes a test, God gives him a promise. And God says, because you've had faith in me that I'm enough for you, you're going to see how awesome a relationship with me is. You know, since, since my uh, junior year, sophomore year, whenever that was, um, my life has changed dramatically, right? Got married. And my wife, I mean, I talked about how gorgeous Heather was. Man, she, my wife is even more gorgeous. I mean, she is this tan, tall, toned, muy caliente Latina. <laughs> I mean, she is, she is gorgeous. She makes Mexican food. That is a big plus. Tortillas from scratch, tamales. I love her. And we have two amazing kids that I think are going to go out there and change the world. And you know what? Heather's doing really good, too. She's got, like, six or seven kids. It's a good thing we didn't get together. <laughs> I say that. Maybe, anyway, never mind. God bless her and her children. But she's, she and her husband are missionaries. They're doing a great work in Haiti right now. And all their kids are being raised with this love for God in a foreign country. And I just think to myself, wow. She went that way. I went this way. We didn't try to manufacture a relationship. We didn't try to do anything like that. And look what happened with God's blessing. And I've made that mistake over and over again. But I look back to that time, and I'm like, man, thank you, Lord, for protecting and guarding my heart. Because that was one of the first times that I learned that God is enough. When people walk away from you, let them go. You don't know if they're going to be back or not. You don't know what they're going through. It's going to be a big issue if you try to turn seasonal friends into lifelong friends. That's not your responsibility to try to control anybody's life. And ultimately, you should be consistently, daily, cultivating and deepening your intimacy with God, just like Abraham did. Because when your intimacy with God is, is deep, you have clarity to see the right thing to do, even if it's letting somebody go and leaning into who is presently in your life. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.